All right, Bigfoot Society, we've got the privilege of having uh, Mr. Henry Franzoni back on the podcast again. It's It's been a while since we last chatted, Henry. How are you? I'm good. I'm really good. How are you? You know, I'm doing good. I It's always a good day when I get to talk to uh, to people about Bigfoot and talk. You know, I consider your person I've talked to a few times, you know, not just on the show, but on the side. And uh, you, you sent me a copy of your new book. I was so excited to hear that you were able to get the book out failing in a cooler way. Why I never found Bigfoot. So we'll get into that later, but it's just, it's just always fun to, to, to chat with you. The last chat we had, we talked about your documentary back in the day and uh, yes, that seems to be what I've no, I'm known for. Yeah. It's a couple a, of those documentaries that are, now old <laughs> they're uh, classic classic 90s bigfoot documentaries if listeners you know, haven't 1996 that, and 1998 yeah. that's really a long time ago you know really surprisingly um, enough it is a long time ago which is <laughs> it's a little scary but you kind of you know you kind of yeah. deal with it but yeah i guess so i'm not i'm not really adjusted to that yet yeah let's let's not as assume that people no, maybe people don't know who you are, but I, I'd like to say that if you're in the Bigfooting world and you know who, who Henry Franzoni is, you're you're having a good time because you just have done some really cool stuff. You've had some, you know, you got involved with Bigfoot back in the 90s, which is a really interesting time frame for Bigfoot research. You were one of the first guys that got involved with, you know, making websites for people and uh, you had the first i want to say the first forum right yeah i created the first online bigfoot discussion group the internet virtual bigfoot conference and many of your bigfoot icons of today were once members of my little online discussion group and there was mm. only one at that time, can you believe it? There was only a single email group about Bigfoot. I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> that, that so it's really different today, you know, for me, because I'm like, wow, okay, you know, that really took off. Holy moly. But Cliff Barrickman was a member. Wow. Yes, I'm trying to think. Moneymaker was there too for a while, but then he split off to do his own thing, you sure. know? So, because he wanted to call his own shots and had his own dream. And hey, more power to him. The guy's lived his dream. So, but yeah, I come from that time. And then I got. I left the whole thing behind in 2000, the year 2000, when most of you hadn't started yet. And I was really sick of it and particularly sick of all the, you know, yelling and screaming and, mm. you know, posturing, lack of, well, let us say, everybody had a checklist. Everybody could rationalize everything to their checklist, but nobody was rational and nobody was reasonable. So just like today, the two sides, paranormal and flesh and blood, just could not talk to each other at all. You know, just couldn't do it. They, they just found each other abhorrent. And I'm hoping, you know, I always hoped it would mellow out some, but. Yeah, by the year 2000, it was just too, you know, too much inflammatory rhetoric and people yelling and screaming. I wanted nothing to do with it. And so I left for 20 years. And now I want to talk about Bigfoot a whole bunch. Absolutely. You know? Now I'm he, like, oh, man, Bigfoot. Let's talk Bigfoot. There's one question I can't let slip away before we get into it. Is there an archive of that, of that forum anywhere? Does that exist in any form? There, I being a computer guy, right, might have an archive of that list on mm. something in my office, 
you know, some electronic storage media that is here. Because at one at one point, I made backups of everything, mm-hmm. and yeah, there was a number of times, you know, like I backed it up, but I also had a real, you know, like in the year two thousand for me, I got rid of all my data. I That's got rid true. of all my track casts. Mm-hmm. I got rid of my databases. I was just like sick of the whole thing. Yeah. Got rid of my hair samples, got rid of all my, all my Bigfoot goodies. And I had a huge collection of Bigfoot goodies at that point. And I just moved on and said, man, I want nothing to do with this. But, um, it wasn't actually that I really completely ran away from Bigfoot. I ran away from the Bigfoot community. There it is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because you read this book and you're like, I don't think he actually just ran away from Bigfoot, but yeah, the community no. you took a the step The community away I did, but I went off into my own thing with Bigfoot and tried to do my own thing for many, many years. And, and now I have like a, different narrative than everyone else that I wish to share. And I just have one piece of the puzzle that I think I've figured out. And I know there's a lot of other people that have pieces of the puzzle figured out, you know, so like, I think I can coexist with all of them somehow. And we'll see how that goes. But yeah, you know, I'm just like another guy throwing in another point of view about it. And I, I kind of of the opinion that when, and this is the problem with my book, when you explain it to somebody, they don't believe you because it's really hard. It's really incredible what is going on. In my opinion, what's going on with Bigfoot is really an incredible deal. So it's an intense um, book and there's, there's so many onion layers to it. I, I learned yeah, it's connected to everything. I can't help but telling people that, you know, Bigfoot is literally connected to everything. <laughs> in my opinion, there was a, a fascinating story. I don't think it's in your first book. Maybe it is, but I don't think it is where you kind of, you share something that happened in 2000 that made you kind of step away as well. And it, it's a really interesting series of events. Is that anything you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit of kind of yeah, involves no, the CIA? I don't and- at all. Yeah. Yeah. See, he, here's the party pooper in me for the Bigfoot community that I have this contrary opinion to everyone else. I think the idea of searching for evidence to prove that Bigfoot exists is a fool's errand and is a complete ridiculous waste of time because I feel that those who ought to know if Bigfoot is real already know that Bigfoot's real. And the U.S. military knows that Bigfoot's real. And it goes far beyond just knowing that Bigfoot's real. They've been working with them for a really long time side by side on various military projects, which I know you might find to be really, really crazy, but that's what I found out. And in the year 2000, I got, I ran into the government stopping me, the CIA, actually, who doesn't operate in America, domestically, by the way, especially in the year 1995. Well, they they stopped me twice. I was actually getting warm in the year 2000, and I might have affected the status quo. That's my opinion. And the government basically said, hey, No, you know, like here, go, you know, chill out. They gave me the big chill out and it was nothing I can prove. And there's no hard evidence. And I'm sorry, Danny Perez, I cannot prove anything of this (laughs) at all. I have no evidence of this kind of thing, but 
basically they communicated to me through a few events that I document in the book that, you know, back off. What I had been convinced of at that moment that they, when they stopped me, by the way, was I was convinced that there was a Bigfoot village or headquarters or base or something underneath Mist, Oregon in the gas caves that lie underneath Mist, Oregon. And I, at that time, I was hell-bent on trying to get to the gas caves uh, underneath Mist, Oregon. And that's when the government basically talked to me and said, stop. <laughs> and in a way of like, the way they stopped me was one arm of our military protected me from another arm of our military. And I saw that there was a division in our military government about this topic. And that was enough for me to just go, hey, I'm just a civilian. I don't want to, I don't know nothing, man. What, you know, sorry, sorry, hands off. And so that really stopped me from being involved publicly with Bigfoot for 20 some years, 22 years, actually, one's counting. And only 22 years later did it become clear that the government, once again, indirectly, not in a way I could ever prove to anybody, communicated to me that it was okay if I ventured my opinion now about things like, hey, there's a Bigfoot base underneath Miss Oregon, <laughs> for example. Now, that's not something that I don't think anybody else is really going to be able to prove, right? I mean, especially since there's a Northwest Natural Gas installation that I think it's under, and it's guarded by the military, strangely enough, which is why I was so suspicious. Because why would a commercial gas company have a military guard? But hey, you know, I think that the government knows all about Bigfoot and scientists and policymakers that really ought to know do know. And Everyone that is in this field that thinks that they're actually accomplishing something by proving that Bigfoot exists by providing evidence to some scientist or policymaker out there is really playing with themselves. I mean, to put it indelicately. Mm. Sorry. And <laughs> that's really, that's really, you know, that's the hard truth. I'm sorry. And yeah, I, knew sure, that yeah. in two, I knew that in 2000. So in 2000, I knew the fix was in, and in short, they show you what they want you to see, and the we are all being fed breadcrumbs by the government, and it got really out of hand because there's a lot more to this story that I'm telling you right now. Mm big part of it is that they, well, you know, my book, it's not like, you know, I really don't want to be that guy that's like, well, you know, well, the CIA, yeah, yeah, my book, it's really cool. No, it's, I'm not that guy. I, right, I right. actually try to, in my book, I try to explain physics principles. When I try to explain why this is, why is the government hiding this? And I try to explain this to you. And it's a strange reason. It has to do with gravometric motors. And it has to do with the news right now of what's going on right now. And I'll tell you what I mean. Okay. So I think that in the night for a hundred years, right after Einstein came up with general relativity engineers military engineers for the u.s government 
modified Einstein's relativity and designed gravometric motors, which they've been working on for a hundred years. And in my book, I document Tesla claiming in 1931 in the Brooklyn Eagle that he has a motor powered by cosmic rays, which was at that time, same thing. Tesla's name for the same thing. So I'm convinced that because this technology and these physics principles, and that's really what I try to just lay out in the book is here's the physics principle. This is the modified Einstein equation that gravimetric motors are constructed with. And it's a physics revolution. And what happened in the 20s was physics split into an open book. That's all the physics we know in the public and a closed book that the U.S. military knows. Mm. And they've been building these UFOs ever since. So now, right now, today, we have congressional testimony, whistleblowers talking about UFOs. Suddenly, the government's attitude is, oh, UFOs are real. We call them UAPs, but oh, yeah, now they're real. We don't know what they are. Yeah, baloney, you don't know what they are. So this is like a scheduled release of information by the government. Oh, absolutely. You know, and they're definitely doing it. And what I'm showing you is the physics principle behind the UFOs you are seeing in their motors. And why I'm showing you that is because the weird thing is, and this is where I differ also from most Bigfoot people. Bigfoot uses gravimetric physics principles in the way they move, in the way they camouflage themselves, in the way they communicate. A lot of what they do is dependent on the same physics principle, which I try to explain in my book. Mm -hmm. And this is why the government didn't want us to know about Bigfoot, because if you understand how Bigfoot moves about and camouflages and does all that stuff, that paranormal stuff. If you actually understand the physics science of it, why that leads you to understanding what our black projects in our military are doing and all the UFO things. But 20 years ago, when they stopped me, they told me that one day they would come to me and they would tell me it was okay. And they came to me and told me it was okay to write my book. Now, the other thing, they weren't very helpful. See, I'm like an unwitting tool <laughs> of these guys because they said 20 years ago, they said, do you know why we told you all these things? And I said, no. And they said, you will. And I'm like, uh, you know, now here I am 23 years later and no, I don't. But I kind of think this is the right time because I see not only the UFO thing going on right now, but I see Dr. Salvatore Payas describing all these physics. And I'm like, oh, okay, I recognize those. I recognize this. And so I'm like, well, gee, I'm probably the only person that does recognize this out there. But I'm like, wait a minute, this is where I was headed 23 years ago. Oh, wow. And now I see that the government, if you actually watched an interview with Salvatore Payas, it really seems like it's some kind of op, you know, the way he talks and just the whole, boy, it's kind of, it's, it's great. And I'm just into the physics, but the government is putting their cards out on the table right now about UFOs and Bigfoot. They're connected and they're connected by gravimetric physics principles that were a huge secret. And for some reason, they're not a secret anymore. And the government is letting all the beans out of the can and the worms out of the whatever. And, or this is the beginning of it. At least that's my opinion. And I feel sure. that I see enough 
that's what my book covers is I see enough breadcrumbs that the government has laid out that they're telling us the real story or putting the, they put the dots out there for us to connect. When I see a lot of these UFO guys talk about, oh, the government's hiding all this technology and everything. I'm like, yeah, yeah, they did for, you know, a hundred years, but they just put everything on the internet so that you can understand what it is. Like, you know, it, they're not hiding it. Here's the physics principles. I sort of do what I think is really obvious, which is you connect all the recent Nobel prizes with Einstein, with all these other things. If you look at the big picture, instead of looking at each little thing and focusing just on that thing and excluding everything else, you realize that the government is actually fessing up to all this secret technology they've held on to for a hundred years. Wow. And it's connected to Bigfoot. It's really connected to Bigfoot because they're actually an advanced scientific species. So this makes me Bigfoot is a person guy, not an animal, right? I'm on sure. that side of the equation. Not only are they a person, but define a person, you know, I mean, that's also what I try to do in my book is to point out what flesh and blood really is, because everybody throws that term around flesh and blood, flesh and blood, flesh and blood. Well, what is flesh and blood? What does it consist of? You know, deconstruct it, whatever, what are its pieces? And flesh and blood doesn't exist unless there's somebody looking at something that's flesh and blood. You know, in other words, flesh and blood implies there's an awareness, there's a consciousness outside of it looking at it. And so you can't separate consciousness from flesh and blood. And that's a fundamental problem for all flesh and blood people because biologists today in current mainstream biology do not understand what consciousness is and what its role is in reality and in physics. And so, unfortunately, the Bigfoot thing goes into that as well because we have to change our science to understand Bigfoot. That's the real problem. We have to understand a different sort of physics. Now, this would be revolutionary, oh boy, except it happened a hundred years ago and they've kept it from us. So I didn't think of anything. I'm just connecting all the dots and I see all the dots laid out there by, you know, mysterious, the hidden hand behind the hidden hand behind the hidden hand. I mean, I have no idea who's doing this, but I, I got some guesses about who's doing this and it's our U.S. military that seems to be maybe not of their own volition. Here's where we get to the other thing, because unfortunately, my book gets into this, too, which is Bigfoot is management of this geometry of space-time. They're actually management. We are the caretakers of this planet, but we are not the brains they are the brains. We are the caretakers. There's a phrase in your book where you say Master Bigfoot rules the world. Is that kind of yeah? That's to basically what, you're what it there? is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Can you explain that? These guys are in short. The short version is indigenous people around the world refer to them as ancestors. Ancestors are the people before. They are an intelligent race that evolved before us. They're our elder brothers. They don't necessarily appear to be Homo sapiens, right? There's some other kind of person in a hominid form or something like that. But they reached a point, you see, there's... 
many, many, you have to read an awful lot of oral histories of a lot of indigenous people, which I get into a lot of in my book. But oh, yeah. the thing is, is that the people before are our elder brothers in most indigenous cultures. Their cultural view of what's going on is completely different than our cultural view here in white man land. In the indigenous, in the Native American cultures, which I'm most familiar with, and which are where I spent the last 30 years, everybody, like the default is you believe Bigfoot is real. Even if you've never seen a Bigfoot, you've heard stories about Bigfoot and you all believe it's real. And then there's many, many layers of knowledge about Bigfoot within the other tribal cultures. What is meant by the term Indian medicine? gets deeper and deeper and deeper and has many, many layers. And what is meant, who Bigfoot is becomes deeper and deeper and deeper. And then you find out that every tribe has a different opinion. And there's really a lot of tribes, 537 registered ones in America or United States right now. The thing that you find out is that how do I explain this simply all of the Buddhist sages and such are using the same physics it turns out that the subconscious mind the true powers of the subconscious mind when accessed by the conscious mind result in your ability to shapeshift, uh, teleport, uh, communicate telepathically. You can do all kinds of stuff with the true powers of the subconscious mind, including like create a black hole with your mind and then walk through it, which is what these guys basically can do. They have so much power in their mind, they can create a black hole and step through it. Kind of like, you know, their own portal to anywhere in the galaxy. So they are a species that has reached an evolutionary stage where they obtained their energy from the fabric of space-time. They no longer bother with other energy sources, such as deer and elk and rabbits. However, they seem to enjoy to hunt them and eat them. You know, like they still relish their creatureliness and they're like hillbillies. So even if they're like advanced scientists, they're really, you know, just as they really relish that creatureliness. But these, they're very much like Indians in that way in that they are very comfortable with their creatureliness and their intellect simultaneously. But when you really master the conscious control of the subconscious mind, you're basically able to do the same thing that our engineers can do in the black military world with gravometric motors. Basically, you can make a gravometric motor with your mind if you have a mind as strong as Bigfoot's mind. They have a super, super strong mind. So what this means is, and part of why you have the association with UFOs, is they're the brains of this planet. So all the other species that come visit here, visit them first we're an afterthought we're they visit the, the bigfoot first yeah it's like okay. start it's like star trek 4 where the right yeah came down for the whales the gray right. whales classic they, yeah they come down they come down for bigfoot not us them because their tele their minds are on another order i mean literally they're like four-dimensional beings all the ones i've met now of course i allow for I only know one tenth of one percent of nothing. And so I know there must be all these other things going on. But this is what 
I know from my experiences, now that I've had 30 years of them, I'm like, yeah, no, the ones I know, um, they all can step in and out of this dimension, <laughs> you know, all of them. And they're all telepathic and they all, you know, I mean, come on. I mean, I, I've never known one that wasn't um, super smart or of the contacts I've had, you know. So that puts me in a strange place with the Bigfoot community because I'm I'm on a different approach than oh, they sure. are. Uh, com you know, yeah, completely, I yeah. Have, I have just a different approach and... We can coexist, though. I mean, I, I really don't have any objections to anything they're doing. In my opinion, Bigfoot can kill you with a thought, and so you should not screw with them at all. You should have a lot of respect. And um, the idea of shooting them or anything is ludicrous to the point of... Uh, and another thing I always say, which is interesting maybe all stories about bodies are false really yes i've never ever ever heard a body story about somebody finding a body body this but dead one there dead that that didn't turn out to be false and it's because no one's ever touched their bodies of all the researchers you know if you think about it and step back and think about everybody. Has anybody ever touched one that you have ever heard of? Hmm. Yeah. Think about it. Right. There might yeah. be. There might be. Okay. You know, I'm just saying, okay, think about it. Now, they look like us. Yes, they're related to us. Yes, they got to be, right? They look like primates or hominids or whatever. They got big butts. But in my opinion, their bodies are not like our bodies. Their bodies are quite different than our bodies. They might look just like flesh and blood like you and me, but they have mental control over the density of their bodies. They have mental control over like the whole structure of their bodies. And one of the first things I encountered was tracks of a Bigfoot that turned into tracks of a deer. And so I knew from 1995, I knew that Bigfoot was a shapeshifter. No one, no one believed that. My own eyes told me that. And I said, wow, you know, I could understand why no one would believe that. That's unbelievable. You know, that's literally unbelievable. But in my early days in my first five years where I went out and examined every sighting report I could find in Oregon and Washington uh -huh. with a team and we had $5 million to look. So it was a full-time thing. We all just ran around like crazy, like the crazy Bigfoot researchers of today. We ran around gathering stories and sighting reports and every bit of evidence we could find to gather, you know, to prove Bigfoot was real, right? To policymakers and scientists. So they would take it seriously. That was the goal of the Bigfoot research project. So, you know, that's also why I failed is that was my goal 30 years ago. And then I became one of the policymakers for the government and one of the scientists for the government. And then I started to see that, oh no, actually, how naive I was about everything. So, you know, yeah, I just want to do a quick pause because I know there's probably a few listeners that are like, why in the world is he not talking to him about the Bigfoot reach guys? There's a first episode where we go deep into it. So you need to make sure you listen and you can stop making that comment in on this YouTube video that right. no, we, you're co about we covered to that. <laughs> we, we covered, covered that. that. that we did. A, that we covered that time. Bigfoot research project. Pretty good. <laughs> yes. There's a question I have for you. So in the book, you mentioned there are places that facilitate contact with the minds operating at different frequencies than ours, and that you know of a couple spots. Is that yeah, anything you I, can go more into? or? Well, yeah, there's, you know, sure. I mean, on the one hand, 
Rene de Hinden told me this a really long time ago. Everyone knows where the hot spots are. And that's true. If you once you're really into this for a while, like many of your listeners, sure. Everybody knows where the hot spots are. You know, you check out all the reports, you go, oh man, they're all around here. So in the other cultures, Bigfoot is a protector. Bigfoot is a, well, it depends on the tribe. The Nez Perce regard Bigfoot as part of their creation story. And they refer to Bigfoot as the monster. Well, there's a connection between Bigfoot and the monster that created their tribe. There was a giant monster that fought with Coyote in the Nez Perce creation myth. And Coyote won and ripped the monster apart. And from his left arm, he made the Sioux, and his right arm, he made the Crow. And there's this huge list as he goes through all the tribes and all the different body parts. And when, <coughs> pardon me, when they get to the heart, Coyote creates the Nez Perce. So there's this huge red rock in Idaho next to Highway 12 at a rest stop called Heart of the Monster. And it's a roadside rest stop today. In the Nez Perce creation story, that's the heart of Bigfoot that landed there when Coyote ripped it out of Bigfoot. The Nez Perce crawled into this world by crawling out from under that rock, from caves that were underneath that rock. And that's how they came to be in this world. So there's a connection between Bigfoot and that. So now they have many places. They have smoking spots around the res where you can talk to the ancestors. And you go up and have a smoke on like one of these little peaks and you talk to the ancestors. And over time, you come to understand that Bigfoot and the ancestors are the same. That Bigfoot are these people that once evolved to a point where once they got full control of the true powers of their subconscious mind, yeah, they could shape shift or they could uh, go to the Delta Quadrant through the wormhole, you know, like they could go anywhere. And at that point, they became the ambassadors for this planet with every other species. And all the species that are evolved to that level where they derive their energy directly from the fabric of space time seem to be location independent let us say like it doesn't really matter where they are where they came from they're everywhere in the universe at the same time wherever they want to be they're there right they're all like the q continuum they can all just like poop 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 everywhere except there's lots of species that are like this we really are the dumb guys in the big picture and bigfoot kind of insulates us from all the others like they're kind of our they're the brains here we're the caretakers and apparently i never thought that this would come out in public but apparently the government's headed towards the point where it's going to confirm this insane claim by me one day i hope <laughs> that'd be <laughs> incredible that's that's yeah. the way i read it the way i read it this insane claim will be confirmed by events one day because um, I'm a drummer and I have drummer timing and I believe in drummer timing, right? You know, mm -hmm. and so the time I believe the time is now for me to offer this whack ball theory out there and say, look, I think you're all going to join me here one day. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> And yeah, I'm not, I don't believe in paranormal. I actually believe there is a science explains everything. Okay. 
So I am not paranormal guy. Although I am often confused for paranormal guy. Like everybody puts me in that box and goes, ah, man, you're into that woo woo stuff. And I'm like, well, I'm actually a scientist. <laughs> yeah. It gets a little, a little weirder than that. Yeah. You, I think you may have alluded to this part in when we were just talking, but there's a part where you say looking out over the thir past 30 years of digging around, learning about little people, giant birds, water monsters, the people before, dogmen, etc. And you talk about some of those in detail in the book, but I don't, I may have missed it, but I don't think you go into dogmen. Did yeah, you have I don't. Any interactions with yes. dogmen stories? Yeah. Yeah. No, I. Here's here's a dogman story, which All right, that you'll was hear the, from oh, me. You'll oh, only boy. hear this one, right? Um, <laughs> so I have a uh, difference about me today and 30 years ago. There are many differences. One is I have a lot of Indian friends. Like I have real good friends that are real Indians. And I come from New Jersey. And th when I grew up, that was never the case when I was little. But today I have a lot of real good friends that are tribal. And a good friend of mine took LSD and was a Nez Perce Indian. And he just went out on a mountaintop and laid down on his back. He just laid down and enjoyed the day, right? He was just tripping and he just checking out nature. And he just laid there for like three hours. And a dog man came over and stood right over him and looked down at him and leaned down really close to him. And he said the nose of the dog man was exactly like a Labrador retriever. It was just like a golden lab in texture. And he got like a really good, really good close look at it because it was like a foot away from him as the Dogman was inspecting my tripping friend who was just like paralyzed on the ground, right? And so he said, Wow, you know, that was really weird. Did I really see that dog man or was I tripping? And so he laid there for like another three or four hours and the dog man came back <laughs> and did the same thing. He didn't hurt him or anything, he just came over. And he just leaned down. He almost touched his nose to his face. And he just leaned down and sniffed him. And whoa. And then he walked away again. So, but I always thought it was interesting that he compared the nose to a golden lab. He said, man, it was exactly like a golden lab nose. It was exactly like a golden lab nose. So, I don't know anyone else that got that close. That's why that that's one of the weirdest dogman stories I've heard. That's pretty cool. I'm going to throw in another curveball before we we talk a little bit more about the book, just for fun, just because it's a weird rabbit trail that I've had come up in different episodes. But in all your time in the Pacific Northwest, have you ever heard any stories about someone seeing something that looks like a hyena? Yes. Really? Yes. There's. I've seen something that looks like a hyena. Let wow. me step back for just a second and say, you know, when cryptids here in the Pacific Northwest, the more you get in, the more you look, the more stuff you run into. And there's really Bigfoot's the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of other weird stuff running around out here. and yeah, I've seen things that look like hyenas. I've seen I I don't I mean I've seen some weird creatures like something that looked like a brown telephone pole on four legs that was low to the ground like about a foot off the ground that ran really fast and and was like about 6 feet long and was tubular but furry and i was like what the hell was that? <laughs> <laughs> you know it, it was not and and 
I being a wildlife monitoring professional, right. I was like, that's not an animal I recognize. What the hell was that? You know, and it was strange. And I've seen things that look like Ewoks from Star Wars. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Like, huh? <laughs> Ewok <laughs> at a distance. But I've got to say, you know, yeah, no, there's weird stuff. And then I've had friends that have seen lizard men, of course, you know. But, oh, man. Um, pterodactyls are pretty common and historically common. The, many of the tribes have a name, Pachanaho, which means crooked beak or rough looking bird. And when you read the descriptions, it sounds like a pterodactyl. And then you see the second floor of the Portland Art Museum has all Native American art, and there are two sculptures of Crooked Beak and Rough Looking Bird and masks of Crooked Beak. And you start to see that there's all kinds of, just like Bigfoot, there's many, many, many tribes that talk about Crooked Beak and Rough Looking Bird. And what they're talking about is this pterodactyl that like still is around. <laughs> That's what they're talking about. And wow. I know a lot of people that have seen them, white and red. You know, I've, I've know a lot of people up here who, you know, they can't bring themselves to tell anybody, but they saw a pterodactyl, you know, and I'm like, yeah, well, the tribes all say there's a pterodactyls that live here. You know, the tribes say they still live here, you know, so. But yeah, there's water monsters too, of course, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's places. Look, it, Every well, yeah, we see, and then yeah, there's there's really there's witches, there are ones that look like people, but they're weird people, you know, mm. like weird women. You run into weird women in the woods. <laughs> I've I've got actually. You know, it's there's some weird stuff out here. Rainier, okay, so I, I I forgot to mention you are based out of the Oregon area. You've been out in Portland area since 1974 when you went out there for college, correct? Correct. Um, yeah. So that's kind of our our background about where we are. But have you ever been out to the Rainier, Oregon area? Endlessly. I mean, I lived very close to it for 20 years. Tell me yes. about the Bigfoot scene in yes. Rainier. Is there oh, anything weird? I could like, tell, tell, yeah, tell, oh, I could tell you bit, all Henry. about it. I yeah. could tell you all about it. Okay. I watched your recent interview you? with a yeah. guy, and I I just said to myself, really, I'm just glad you asked me because I know, I know things about that. I just thought oh. that guy's story was so fascinating, right? Yeah. I was like, Oh, man. That's on top of the mist gas caves. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Oh, no, Henry. Yes, it's right on top. Oh, jeez. Yeah, and so that's where I was looking, right? That's where I said, hey, there's a Bigfoot base underground here. <laughs> you were looking in that same area, and that's when the CIA shut exactly you down? I knew exactly where his house was. Yeah, I knew Holy exactly mackerel. where his house was. When he described Near City Road and he described where he was on Near City Road, I was like, I know exactly that property. You know, I was like, I know exactly where that guy lived. I, I was like, and then he said, well, I lived down here in the company land. And I went, oh, I know exactly. Next to Evenson's holding, I know the timber baron that owns all the land around him. Evenson, who is someone I've worked with for 20 years. I was the watershed council coordinator for the lower Columbia River Watershed Council. So I was responsible for doing wildlife restoration for all those people in that area, all across Columbia, across the county there. So I really knew that. I, w I went all through that area as the watershed guy, right? I'm the watershed environmental. After I retired, the uh, state of Oregon hired me to do salmon stuff for them. So 
I really know that area. But let me continue. The power lines where he is talking about mm -hmm. when they built Trojan, this see, I've studied that spot for a long time. For 30 years, I've known Bigfoot hangs out there. A Jeez, lot of them. Because I've known a lot of people. That guy is like one of 30 people I know, right, in that area. And oh, why sorry, that sorry. is. Clar is clarify. So you know the guy or that you've no. heard? Okay. No, okay. I mean, I know. I know a lot of other people. Okay, sorry. Yeah. I don't know him, but I know from his story, boy, did I know every detail of his story. I could instantly visualize because I was familiar with his property. <laughs> I thought it was funny that he talked about the way they moved, how they tilted and just moved without, and he never talked about whether or not they left tracks and he never talked about, you know, whether or not they made a sound as they moved. And he made inferences that they were really quiet when they moved. And I was like, yeah, that's because they're actually like not even touching the branches, you know, but oh, man. that was me thinking that way. I was going, God, you know, and then he kept going, Hey, it was an animal, an animal. God, it looked like it had down syndrome, like a guy, but it right. was an animal, an animal. And I kept thinking, yeah, he has a hard time processing that it's a person with down syndrome and it looks exactly like a person with down syndrome yet his rational mind's going no it's an animal an animal 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 and i'm like no it's a person you were right it's a person with down syndrome you know mm. so wow. um, I, I thought that was really amazing that he really like his own eyes he could not believe his own eyes that it was a person it was an animal, damn it, you know, and his father was trying to shoot him all the time. And I was thinking, well, that, that, no wonder. And then when he talked about the authorities seemed to know about it and were oh, like trying totally. to get the dad not, you know, man, I oh. know, it, you know, here's why when they <laughs> built Trojan, there were big footprints all around Trojan. What? Throughout the whole construction process. Because Bigfoot is attracted to energy sources like a moth is to a flame. From the perspective that they have, from where they live, which is not quite our dimension, things like nuclear reactors look like light bulbs. And like a moth, they are like, what's going on with that energy source? And so this is also my opinion. But mm -hmm. this is something that I've had a lot of experience with. <laughs> and that is, yeah, all the nuclear reactors, when they get built, have Bigfoot footprints around them, according to what I've been able to infer. Really? Because, big, yes, Bigfoot is attracted to atomic energy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Believe it or not, I know it's pretty weird. So that guy lives right between... The Northwest Natch on a straight line, the power line that crossed his property goes to Trojan Nuclear Plant and then goes to the Northwest Natural Gas Facility that I was talking about Holy that has mackerel. the military guard. And he's talking about the power line that connects the two. Okay. That's what he's talking about. So and he's yeah, when I, if you want to see him, go on that power line. Right. And I'm like laughing to myself going, well, yeah, you know, because at either end of that power line, <laughs> 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 man, you're going to, you're going to hit pay dirt, dude. You know? Oh. So yeah, that's where I got stopped 23 years ago was near there. Right. Actually at the other end of the power line. The other end of the power lines where I was trying to get into the gas caves under there. Well, I was convinced they lived in the gas caves under there, right? So, gee, oh. that guy's story kind of confirms my theory in a way. Okay. But, Dis you know, disclaimer, don't way. try to go into the gas. Like, <laughs> listeners, don't mess around. 
Right. Don't, no, don't it, you're not. They won't please. let you in there, man. No, okay. it really does have an armed guard. <laughs> and that, it does really. You know, wow. It really does. Yeah. No, you. Eh, eh. You. Uh, yeah. Don't you do it, guys. Close. No, you ain't getting close. It. No. Yeah. And it's not military. It's Northwest natural gas. Wow. But you know they might be just defending against terrorists is probably the rationale. Yeah, uh, probably. You know, um, hardened hardened site for terrorist protection probably or something so are there a yeah, lot of you, you'll sightings? never get near it yeah are what? there a lot of sightings over the years in that area then yes. that you've yes yeah oh wow yes oh my goodness i columbia county vernonia oregon there's well pardon me rainier it's right on the river. And if you go straight back from the river, like the power line does, you run it. Yeah. Th there's a lot of sightings in that area. I mean, less so today. Hmm. When Trojan was being built, there were really a lot. And okay. see, I bought a house from a guy that an engineer that built Trojan. So I heard stories from the guy I bought the house from. And then oh I knew engineers that worked at Trojan. And I heard stories from them, too. So I've been assembling this information for 30 years from different, all kinds of, because I was a local guy, I could talk to all kinds of local contractors and cops and everybody. I knew everybody wow. in the county for a while. So, you know. Although, <laughs> don't bring my name up there today. That's for sure. Oh, really? Not well, a good thing, or no? Oh. I just had a whole political deal with. Oh, uh, sure, yeah. Recent okay. political stuff. I was a. I was watershed council coordinator, like I mentioned before, and mm -hmm. I saw funds being misused instead of being used for salmon mitigation or salmon recovery. They were being used to lobby the legislature to reduce the cutback limits from stream banks. In other words, opposite of what they should be used for to save the salmon, they were being used to increase the logging down to the stream edge. And so I killed the watershed council mm. and went to the state and made sure it would never see another dime of public funds ever again wow. and it died and i killed it and so the commissioners of columbia county i am not their most favorite guy this week you know yeah, may, probably um, not <laughs> no i am not their most favorite guy but right. i had to do it because i'm a salmon sign i'm I've dedicated my whole life to saving the salmon out here. That's sure. what I've done. And I don't like seeing my life's work, you know, treated shabbily. So. Yeah. yeah. Makes sense. I you did the to, right thing. I did the right thing. They got, yeah. Well, yeah. They got me out of retirement and I ended up <laughs> being awesome. like their worst hire ever. You know, that's amazing. So, um, <laughs> I'm guessing all the info you took from those engineers was probably lost in 2000. I, yeah, I yeah. hate to say to you modern folks researching Bigfoot, yeah, at one point I threw everything away. Well, right. now, here's what I did. I okay. gave everything I could find to Autumn Williams. Autumn Williams, right, yep. Once upon a time, once upon a time, somewhere around 2000. And I gave everything else, uh, I mean, I just gave everything away. I can't, yeah, I can't remember who I gave it to, but I gave it to anyone who wanted it at that point, you know, and I just gave everything away. And Cliff Barrickman helped me by giving me one track cast to start my track cast collection again. What a guy. So I have one cast. What's the cast? It's a little baby short, baby Bigfoot. I'm not sure, actually. I should ask him for the Provence provenance of this cast yes yes yeah, totally. I don't, yeah yeah it's my first bigfoot artifact yeah well the thing is is that it got so existential for me i didn't need the data anymore you know honestly that's also what happened is 
I found an answer that did not require this data. The data I need is funding to create a high frequency gravity detector. That's what I need. And then I'll find you your Bigfoot. And actually, yeah, you know, that's another thing is that I may make some demonstrations of this technology to actually persuade some of the people that think I'm totally out of my mind. But we'll see if I do that or not. I've been th I've been toying with the idea because I can kind of prove what, I, well, rather than finding evidence, what I do in my book is I take the existing framework of science, of physics, mm -hmm. Einstein's equation, and I show my work and I show each step and I show how to evolve it to a whole new physics that explains Bigfoot and that I believe Bigfoot uses. And then we get into the weird stuff like maybe we learned it from Bigfoot or I don't know, you know, I mean, we've been working together with Bigfoot sure. because the path I took took me here. This is where I wound up. I'm, I feel like I'm like everyone else. And I started out looking at the Patterson film and going, it's a hoax, just like everyone. <laughs> and I wound up here 30 years later, and I'm afraid you will too, because the more time you spend at this, the weirder it gets. Dude, that it's, it's like in your first book. It's like, you got to be careful going down the path to Seattle because it's like, gets so weird you go too far down man you can't get back out it's Unless so the weird cia comes after you you know but. well no they're just you see i don't think they're calling the shots i think it's bigfoot that's calling the shots right oh, that's who i think who's in charge wow who, who really has power <clears throat> in this place we live mm. i don't know who really has power on this level of things i mean we know you know, Elon and money and this and that, but I'm talking about real power, power to create black holes with your mind, the power to shapeshift, perhaps alter reality itself with your mind. This kind of power, who has that kind of power? And I think we may actually be not, I think the U S government may not be in charge of keeping these secrets Bigfoot might be telling them to shut up and keep these secrets, you know, mm -hmm. and now they're telling them it's okay. You can talk now. I think our government may be getting this message. Not just me is what I think is that, you know, I got the message to shut up and come back. And, and that's the other thing I should say about 23 years ago in my experience is that when the government stopped me, it seemed Bigfoot was in on it because they provided me with experiences that confirmed that they sort of knew what was going on. You know, like in other words, in my Bigfoot life, I've had experiences with people and then with big feet that confirm each other. Like there's obvious communication going on between those two parties these people and these big feet and they obviously have a plan together i don't think other people run into that i don't you know i don't you can know, you and, provide an example i i find that that's pretty interesting can you provide an ex like an example of what you mean by that how that's yeah. happened okay so let me let me think of a specific thing So I'm talking to this government guy one day. Okay. And the guy in my book who I worked with for 10 years, who I had the falling out with when things got super weird. And he 
told me a whole bunch of stuff about Bigfoot. One thing he told me was that, well, if you want to talk to him, just go out in your backyard. You can talk to him in your backyard. And I was like, what? Huh? And over time, I realized he did just walk out in his backyard and talk to him, and he was friends with them. And I was like, oh, my God, he's friends with them and just walks out in his backyard and talks to them. And they come and talk to him. And he lives in the middle of the city of Portland. Wow. And so I was like, holy shit, what's going on with Bigfoot? And so he told me, he said, well, the thing about them is they have a, they all communicate to each other all the time. So if you talk to one, you've talked to all of them. And I said, really? He said, yeah, it's like the Borg. If you talk to one, you talk to all of them. I said, oh, okay, that's weird. And so then I was east of Estacada in the Cascade Mountains about a month later. Okay. And I'm riding in a van <clears throat> and... The windows are closed and my wife is in the passenger seat and we're riding along and we both hear, I hear in my right ear and she hears in her left ear, psst, like somebody going, Hey, you know, and we both just turn instantly and look at each other and go, what? Cause we both think the other one went psst in their ear. Then we realize it's an invisible Bigfoot in between us that did this to both of us. Wow. And we're inside a van, right? And so I'm like, okay, really funny. Okay. So it freaks out and everything. And I'm like, okay, that was really weird. Okay, fine. So then a month later, I'm in the coast range up the Nihalem River, whole different place, about 150 miles away. And I'm not in a van. <laughs> I'm sitting there with my wife and almost the same thing happens again. Same thing happens except we're sitting there. And then I go, whoa. And I hear somebody laughing and I go, whoa, it's like the laughing guy again. And I'm like, I really get the feeling that this was that even though nothing verbal was said, I get the feeling that this was them confirming that what my friend said, like it just all happened within two months. My friend said, you talk to one, you talk to them all. And then in this mountain range, this guy comes up between me and my wife goes, Psst. And then over here in this mountain range, this guy comes up between me and my wife goes, Psst, and then laughs. And I took it all in and said, okay, they're all in on it together. That was my assumption. That may not be true. That's what the way I read the tea leaves at that point. I was like, you know, that's, that's a weird thing. Now, a lot of that is my intuition and a lot of that is my feelings because i had nothing more concrete to go on the whole thing being telepathic in the first place right now other things there were just so many things actually I'm just trying to, you know, the physics was really where it would happen, where my friend and I would be into a big physics discussion about what the physics in my book, and we would be talking about gravity, and we would start talking about how he said, well, you know, first it was small, and then it was big. And I was like, oh, yeah, because I realized when you modify Einstein's equation, that's what happens is gravity, this tiny little thing becomes this really, really big thing. And 
And I was like, wow, yeah, that's, that's cool how that happens. And then I went camping, like I was on one of my many, many, many times where I'm out in the woods doing salmon fish counting and stuff and building salmon detectors, which is, was my job. And I get like a confirming event where suddenly I hear a four inch thick log breaking right next to me. And it sounds like a big crack, not like a log hitting a tree, but like somebody snapping a four inch log in half. And I realize that it's an electrical snap. It's a really, really loud electrical snap. And I'm out in the middle of the woods in Idaho, <laughs> you know, like, and it's Ow. like, snap. And I'm like, whoa. And I smell the ozone. And I'm like, whoa, you know, what the hell was that? And then I think about my friend's discussion about how you flip the field equation around and the gravity comes from being small to big. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, like that, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> and it was just, there were always things like this, like it was a curriculum, and my friend would say things, and then, like, weird shit would happen, or I'd see a, well, another perfect example, this one, too, um, I see the UFO come out of the ground in front of me one day and I describe it to my friend and he says, you know, they're magnetic. I said, what do you mean? He says, if you have a compass, it'll track them and it'll follow it. So if you see another UFO, pull out your compass and it'll track the UFO. And I said, really? He said, yeah, yeah. And so the next time I saw a UFO, and there were many times after that I saw a UFO, I pulled out a compass, and it tracked the UFO. And I said, wow, they're magnetic. Who knew? So I knew my friend knew something because that wasn't something I found on the Internet. You know, that's not something I've ever found in any of the UFO anythings, you know. I've never heard that either. Nobody's yeah. ever said that, right? And my friend mm -hmm. just showed that to me like, hey. Well, you know, next time you see one, pull out a compass. And I'm like, oh, wow, you know, that's weird. And then my friend also warned me from certain areas. He said, don't go near Lolo Pass. And I said, okay. He said, yeah, the ones around Lolo Pass are not friendly. So I talked, wow. speaking of what uh, Indians spoke, Indians have told me, many places to go where there are friendly ones and i have only received one or two warnings of where not to go because there are unfriendly ones i have not gone to any of these places but i have a bucket list in my head of okay i'm going to go to these friendly ones eventually i think but hmm. i need a reason you know that's the other thing is bigfoot seems to operate by necessity and they do what's necessary. And so they don't seem to do things that are unnecessary from whatever their perspective is, that is. And so it's like part of why I think I had a lot of interaction with them is I wanted their help to save the salmon. And I wondered how we could collaborate or work, you know, with towards similar goals in saving the salmon in Columbia River because that was my life goal. Right. And so I always thought of Bigfoot as a conservationist, as a true conservationist, and I aspired to be a true conservationist. And I think that maybe that's why I had a 30-year relationship with Bigfoot because I'm not wrong about that. And I don't think I'm wrong about them being the brains either. And I think that one of our roles as people is to actually be the caretakers of all the other species of plants and animals and living things here. 
I think that's what Bigfoot would like to see us do, but free will being free will, I think it's up to us, right? So, oh, sure. Yeah. You know, I'm kind of opposite of everybody else who goes, wow, you know, we got to save the environment for Bigfoot. I'm like, you're living in Bigfoot's lab. You are already in the lab under study. You are. Mm. They are studying you. <laughs> wow. You're the you're the subject, buddy. You know, so that's really quite at odds with the rest of the Bigfoot community, I think. Oh, absolutely. It's you big know? time at odds. Yeah. Uh, oh well. <laughs> you know, but hey, stuck with, they're lost, right? Know, Last yeah, well, question. I mean, you need you need variety for a little spice. You, you do, yeah. Somebody's got to say something different in the Bigfoot community. <laughs> Last question, because I'm sure, like, again, I'm I'm I feel like I'm tuned into my listeners after five years that I I can almost sense the guys that are asking me this right now. Can you share the places where like the friendly ones are, or the places where it's like? don't go or is that a thing where like if you can't that's fine too but yeah i i can't most of them okay but lolo no pass i'll tell you lolo pass which is the one that is on the border of montana and idaho highway 12 okay that's the one i was warned to stay away from i will definitely tell you that okay. that there were a bunch up there and stay away from them that isn't probably a place you guys even would look for baby. <laughs> so, the, the, I'm trying to think of what else to, that I could tell you. The, the thing about fundamental thing you got to understand is they live outside this geometry of space time. Most of the time they're invisible. Most of the time. And location is irrelevant. Mm. They really, it doesn't matter. You all think they live in the woods. No, they live wherever and go wherever. Sure. And maybe spend a lot of time underground. I think they've got a lot of villages, bases, something. They've got something going on underground. There's a lot of underground stuff here in Washington where I live now. There's mm. a lot of underground Bigfoot stuff for sure. Right. But yeah, the thing is, is that no, I can't, you know, that's, that's part of what I have to where I have to draw the line where I can't actually tell everybody the cool places because absolutely, I know that, you know, I know it'll happen. And also, most of these places you can't get to because like a bunch of them are on the Western closed portion of the Yakima reservation. Oh yeah. Got it. People okay. aren't allowed. And yeah. you know, all the, all the forbidden zones is, <laughs> but right. no, there's, there's, there's really a lot in that. In 30 years, when I started, I used to think here in Oregon and Washington, I knew of like maybe five. Mm. Now I know of maybe 50. Wow. And so there's really a lot. And I'm learning, I'm still finding new ones all the time. And I have like my methods for looking which have to do with look for magnetic anomalies. I mean, there's, there's a place near here where a compass deviates by three degrees and it's actually on the chart. And I'm convinced that those kind of places are like homes of big feet. And there's magnetic anomalies all throughout the mountains you can find if you go looking. And there's a tendency. I mean, this is getting weird, but. So when I looked at That's all the cool. data, when I looked at all the data, like a computer geek. Yeah. And looked for patterns 
in the data, which I spent way too much time trying to do, I found that the continental divide of every continent is a place where there's a lot of sighting reports throughout history. And the coastline is also a place where there's sighting reports throughout history. So when I gathered like 8,000, all the sighting reports I could ever gather, and I put them on a map of a North America, uh -huh. it drew basically a really good outline of North America, like the entire coastline was where mo many of the sighting reports were. And then the continental divide all along the continental divide. And as you go North, there are more sighting reports. So sighting reports begin to be of a high frequency at 45 degrees latitude and North. And the more North you go, the more there are. And mm. you can't look at the sighting reports. You have to look at something I call normalized sighting report frequency, meaning that everybody looks at how many sighting reports there are and they think, hey, you know, there's more here. That's where they're more Bigfoot. No, the formula you got to remember is the number of people per square mile times the number of creatures per square mile equals the probability of seeing the creature. And so this means that if there are more people, there's more probability of a sighting report. If there's more animals, there's more probability of a sighting report. But if you factor all the sighting reports of animals and you divide it by the population density of human observers, you get a normalized sighting report frequency that factors in how many people are there. And so you get a like modified sighting report frequency. And when you look at that number, that's when you see the northward shift. And when you see the coalescing of all the sighting reports around the continental divide. But if you think about it, the Yowie, is seen mostly in the Blue Mountains of Australia. The Yeti is seen mostly in the Himalaya, also the Continental Divide. Oh, wow. The Tian Shan Mountains are also the Kian Divide. The Almasty and the Pamir, also the Continental Divide. The Urals, Caucasus, also the Continental Divide. So the entire chain of Continental Divide Mountains is where all the different big feet creatures are most often seen worldwide and you start to see that pattern when you look at all the things endlessly and then when you look at it closer you start to see that the more north you go above 45 degrees latitude the more there are and really it seems that if we were way up north <clears throat> like it looks like probably there's way more big feet in alaska and the tundra and the Northwest Territories than there are down mm -hmm. here. There just aren't enough people to see them. Right, exactly. That's that's what it looks like to me when you look at the normalized sighting frequency, right? So this means that studying the tribes that live on the continental divide yields the most Bigfoot stories. And the most locations of contacting Bigfoot. But like I said, after a while, you realize that it's all in your head. You like, I now know there are people that just can go out in their backyard and talk to them. And I know tribal people that have relationships and, like, I know these people exist. I'm not one of them, but now I know they exist. And I'm like, wow, you know, there really are people that are friends with Bigfoot, you know, really. Boy, and they're they're not talking to us. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, we're, we're out. We're out of the loop, man. We're like, we're not in on it. But there really are these people. And they don't, they're not in the public eye. 
most of them are military and tribal and military is where I've run into people that no way they're, more than me, you know, they're, mil know. they're military that have the ability to go into their backyards and talk to big. Yes. Kids. Really? Yes. Wow. Yes. U S military. Oh, wow. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. Henry. That, wow. That's where I'm like, well, that's where I'm like, are you serious looking for evidence? You guys, I mean, who are you going to convince? I mean that, and I realize it's because nobody like me has ever even said what I'm saying right now. Like, Oh yeah, the government knows. Screw it. You guys, come on. You know, everybody's like, well, I don't know. I've been a part of the community before and I know what I'm saying is provocative and will, you know, I'm ready though. I, I have thick skin these days. So, but I, I mean, I know I'm stirring up the hornet's nest by if anyone cares beyond thinking I'm just totally insane. And I know how hard it is to believe, but I also think that events will unfold the way I read all this UFO disclosure stuff and everything is you'll all come and join me. I hope in my lifetime. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> oh, Henry, it's been super fun chatting with you. I just want to point out again, I'll have the link in the show notes, but feeling in a cooler way, why I never found Bigfoot. Henry's new book. I'm going to have the previous your previous book linked as well because I think that's a fabulous read too and an incredible resource of all the places mentioned in the U.S. that have to do with Sasquatch and other things. It's fantastic. Yeah, they're really... Yeah, they don't cover the same material. That's for sure. Yeah, so. it, it totally different <laughs> reads, but both great reads. But anything else, Henry, that you'd want listeners to know about how to keep up to date with you know, stuff you may put out and things of that nature? No, I mean, I've got a yeah, website, but yeah. and which, which you'll see the link to, but I'm going to present at the Yakima Bigfoot Con on October 28th. Oh, man. So I'm actually going to do my first public thing back, well, you know, back here in Western civilization. Yes, I'm back in Western civilization and I'm doing the first one in 20. I, I guess I did one in 2008. Somebody pointed out that I, I first was like, I haven't done anything in 22 years. And they're like, no, you, I saw you in blah, blah, blah. It's more like 15. So yeah, 15, but it's been 15 years and I am now re-engaging with all of the Bigfoot people of the world that love Bigfoot, you know, or pursuing Bigfoot or whatever your thing is. I, I'm dying to talk Bigfoot again. <laughs> Absolutely. We're, we're, we're glad to, to chat it with you again, but thanks so much for hanging out, Henry. Oh, Until welcome. the next Thank time. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much.